We've already detected dark matter. We've already seen its effects here on Earth and in the heavens itself. But what if I told you dark matter has been a mystery in physics for over 70 years? In this episode, we're taking a deep dive into the one form of dark matter that we know 100% exists, into the impossible. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Dark matter is fascinating. It continues to mystify and tantalize astronomers, physicists, cosmologists, and more to this very day. Today, we're gonna to take a deep dive into one particular form of dark matter that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt actually exists. To learn about the unknown, first study the known as well as you possibly can. I like to give an analogy based on the following joke. There's a cop, a policeman, and he's looking around and he sees a drunk guy on his hands and knees looking for something underneath a street light. And he says to the drunk guy, what'd you lose? The drunk guy says, ah, I lost my keys. So they both start looking under the lamppost until the policeman says, are you sure you lost them here? And the drunk says, no, I lost them in the park. So the cop says, why are you looking here? And the drunk says, this is where the light is. It's not so silly a strategy. And in fact, I think it's one that we can pursue in order to reveal the properties of dark matter more fully. Today, we can employ this strategy not to look for things in the light, but to look for things that are dark. For decades, a similar type of strategy to this drunk guy has been employed both by drunks and by neutrino hunters. So far, they've had no keys in sight and only obtained a few key insights. In 1916, Einstein published the second of his general relativity papers. 100 years later, Using Einstein's predictions, we are at the precipice of weighing the last elementary particle whose mass is unknown. Isn't this old news? Don't we know all the fundamental particle masses already after measuring the Higgs boson's mass? Well, yes and no. Looking at the standard model, we see 16 massive particles, quarks. We also see leptons, like the electron, and bosons, such as the photon and the Higgs boson and they're all charted together in a table that's reminiscent of Mendeleev's periodic table of the elements, except in the case of the quarks, bosons, and leptons on the table, there are no periods observable. There's no apparent ordering at work here. Three of the six so-called leptons, and lepton means small in Greek, these are particles that don't participate in the strong nuclear force. These leptons have three generations. We also see three generations of neutrinos, the electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. And as integral as they are to the foundations of matter, we are in the dark about their masses, the neutrino masses. Now, a particle's mass is arguably its most important property. So this lacuna is rightfully seen as an embarrassment for physics and for physicists. But this is about to change. Neutrinos change their flavor, their generation, from one flavor to another as they propagate through the cosmos. This phenomenon is called oscillation, and the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics went to Kajita and McDonald for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, showing that neutrinos have mass. Not only do we know neutrinos have mass, their work gives us a lower limit on their masses. At least one of the three neutrinos must have a mass bigger than that of about 1 20th of an electron volt. Physicists use uh, Einstein's relationship, E equals mc squared, to convert masses into equivalent energies. The next heaviest elementary particle is the electron, whose mass is 10 million times larger than that lower limit. Most importantly, these lower limits on neutrino masses give us experimentalists thresholds to target. All that's left is to build a scale to weigh these wistful, ghostly particles. Neutrinos are generated in nuclear reactions such as fusion and radioactive decay. The ultimate reactor, of course, was the biggest cauldron of them all, the Big Bang. Like light, neutrinos are stable. Their lifetimes are infinite because, like light, there is nothing for them to decay into. Since it's impossible to collect enough neutrinos to weigh them in a terrestrial laboratory, cosmologists use massive galaxy clusters as their scales. Sprinkled amidst the luminous matter in the clusters are innumerable neutrinos. Their masses can be measured using gravitational lensing, a direct consequence of Einstein's general theory of relativity. All matter, dark and luminous, gravitationally deflects light. Gravitational lensing rearranges photon trajectories, as Eddington showed in the famous 1919 total solar eclipse. Star positions were displaced from where they should have been due to the presence of the sun's massive warping of space-time. The light that should have been there was lensed gravitationally. The amount of movement told us the mass of the lens, in this case, the sun. What kind of light should we use to weigh the poltergeist particle, such as a neutrino? There certainly aren't enough neutrinos in our solar system to bend the sun's light. The most promising source of all 
is the oldest and most abundant light in the cosmos, the 3 Kelvin Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. These cosmic photons arose from the same ancient cauldrons that produced the neutrinos themselves, that now ply the universe today. The CMB is a type of cosmic wallpaper, a background against which all the mass of all the matter in the foregoing foreground clusters of galaxies, including neutrinos, can be measured. In 2015, the Planck satellite showed powerful evidence for the gravitational lensing of the CMB using a technique that is eventually guaranteed to detect neutrino masses. This technique, based on the CMB's polarization properties, will dramatically improve in the future, thanks to a suite of experiments deploying tens of thousands of detectors cooled below one-tenth of a Kelvin at the South Pole and in the Chilean Atacama Desert. Neutrinos are the very paradigm of dark matter. They're massive, they get lensed, and they interact at least gravitationally. All the required properties of dark matter, they don't interact with light. They are not the dominant form of the cosmos' missing matter, but they are the only form of dark matter that we have honest-to-goodness measurements about. After we measure the masses, we can thin the herd of potential dark matter candidates. Just as there are many types of ordinary matter particles, ranging from quarks to atoms, we might expect there are also several kinds of dark matter. Perhaps there's a dark periodic table. The hunt is on to directly detect dark matter, and several exciting upgrades to liquid noble gas experiments are coming online in the coming years. Perhaps there will be detections, but so far, the direct detection experiments have only produced upper limits. In the end, neutrinos might just be the only form of dark matter we ever get to see. The next century of general relativity promises to be as exciting as the first. Space-time tells matter how to move. Matter tells space-time how to curve, said the famous John Archibald Wheeler. We've seen where the curvature is. Now we just need to find out what's the matter. And where to look better for that lost matter is where the dark is. So what do you think? Should we probe more and more the properties of neutrinos, the only form of dark matter we know to exist, or keep searching for new types of particles, or maybe new forces of nature responsible for gravity's deflection at the larger scales in the cosmos? Leave a comment below and let me know what you think is the most promising avenue to discover more about the mysteries of dark matter.